Clayton, how you doing? Well, with you, what do you expect? <laughs> I'm doing great. Well, it's you good to see you. feel good. Mm -hmm. It's always good to see you. Thank you. It's my pleasure. Mm -hmm. So let's start. What was the moment? Was there a moment when you decided this is when I need to get involved in this movement, this civil rights movement, this black freedom movement? Yeah, I was sheltered as a child. Um, my father talked about people in general, that you'll be um, running into moments when you'll be restricted from your, with your mobility. 
but don't ever, ever, ever let anybody restrict your ability. So no, there'll be limitations. I thought you were just talking about people in general. Went to college and um, Tennessee State. in Nashville, Tennessee State, yes. And um, things were going okay, uh, but one night uh, four of us uh, students went out. On the way back to the dorm, we said, let's get some hamburgers. And we stopped at a White Crystal. And I always will say that because uh, I'll never eat another crystal again. We walked in. We had money in our pockets. All we wanted was a hamburger. The guy was by himself. I don't know his owner, manager, whom. It didn't matter. But he said uh, he had a big butcher knife. And he used the N-word. And I don't mind using it. I hope you don't Go right object. In. He said, if you niggers don't get out of here, I'm going to cut your heads off. You know you don't belong in here, so get out. Well, of course we did, but the pain was inside of you. It still is today. Because he said, two things that bothered me to this day is don't belong here. I have felt that piercing word many, many times, belonging. What prevents me from belonging? I realized after, you know, I knew what was going on, put it all I wasn't completely naive, but the reality hit. I knew that I was black in America, and there's nothing I could do to pretend like I wasn't. So I knew then every opportunity I got to fight racism, I was going to do it. So it was kind of like my defining moment, but I knew then that racism was real. Now I heard about it, read about it, but when it hits you, you know it. So that was the beginning, I think. And the fact that you say it still pierces you, it, you still, interesting, when I interviewed Reverend C.T. Vivian, and he was recounting uh, what he went through, and I could see it literally in his eyes. And we're talking and smiling, laughing, all of a sudden his eyes begin to narrow that here he was at 93 and he still felt it. Well, it's sort of like some things you don't, some people say when they had surgery, they remembered when they had the incision. You still feel it. I guess the pain of whether it's memory or whatever it is, it, maybe it's hard to describe, but it stays with you. But I've interviewed people like um, ball players who said that um, one guy um, was hired right after Jackie Robinson. And um, he said the, the, the owner of the team, the manager, would say, listen, guys, we're going out here to play ball, and we're going to win. It's not just you. It's the team, the team. Everything he said was the team. This is team spirit, not you, the team. He'd go out, play ball, win, come back, the team, came back, then he would have to go to a segregated area behind the curtain to lunch because he said, you always got to feel like I don't belong, I'm not worthy. Those two phrases he said haunted him, you don't belong, you're not worthy. And it looks like, Roland, that as African Americans, we are always trying to prove our worth. And it's happened to me a hundred times. I don't have time to tell you all the times. But you hear white people say, you don't belong here. You know better. But why don't you belong? And you hear it today. Today. You hear it today. I mean, mm -hmm. even when you, you, when you hear these conversations, when you look at the attacks mm -hmm. uh, on NFL players who are protesting and Colin Kaepernick, oh, go back to where you came from. This is where I tell people, Jim Crow had kids and grandkids. Let's let's not act like all yeah. of a sudden uh, the election of a black president, having a black governor in Virginia, Massachusetts, having black CEOs somehow just erased all of that. That's true. We just seem like that ugly head of racism keeps raising itself. And our political times today are not helping. Uh, I think we're in a climate now where it's okay to bring your hatred out. It started with Obama when he was president. 
um, I think they just resented the fact that he had made it. And now I think um, uh, white racism has just said it's okay to do it because of the climate of our country. Well, one of the things that I've talked about is that we are, we're operating in this period of what I call white minority resistance. Even though they're not in the minority, but they see where we are going. They see that by 2044, uh, no one group will be the majority of the folks in this country. And there's this fear, and that there's this fear of losing power, fear of losing money, fear of losing control. And when you now see reports where 50-plus uh, percent of whites think that there is rampant discrimination against white Americans, which is beyond laughable. Uh, when you begin to, when they say, well, well, millennials, white millennials won't be the same, but when you look at the polling data, they hold some of the same feelings. What we're seeing is that there's a fear of no longer being able to run everything in America the way they desire. I think that's the prevailing mood. Uh, well, the reality is just no longer just a mood, it's reality uh, that we have proven a lot of our value, um, even when it's not acceptable uh, and not accepted. Uh, it's proven that you know we can control, we can do, we can work, we can perform. And I remember getting a letter uh, from a white mother in Mid America, who said that she was taught this was in a relationship to the Trumpet Awards. She had been w watching the awards and seeing that African Americans had been doing a lot uh, to add to the richness of this great country. And she said it was that typical uh, awakening for her that. Her mother and father both taught her that all black people were lazy. She said, didn't say some, a lot, mm -hmm. all. She said, all black men would rather stand in line to get a welfare check than to get a paycheck. Oh, yeah. That all black women would rather have a baby than have a job. So she grew up hating us. And it wasn't until she just kind of latched on to the uh, viewing of the Trumpet Awards and saw the contributions we were making, that her notion now was changing. She said we piqued her interest, and she started going to the libraries, trying to learn more, and found out that her parents had not told her the truth, that um, she now had two girls. One was three and one was five. And she did not want them to grow up in the same ignorance she did, so sent us the tape for the Trumpet Awards. And that was what she was calling about. Um, that notion is not widespread. I think there are people who still feel that way about African Americans. But the reality is, is the, the picture is a lot different from what people perceive us to be. We're doing things now, running and governing and performing and doing well. And it doesn't set well to those who want to believe otherwise. But the key, key thing you said there was, this was a woman who was in middle America. We call it flyover country. We saw after the election of Trump, all these people who said, oh, we've got, these people are frustrated. They, they're losing opportunities. We've got to really understand them. And every time I would hear working class, that's who they would be talking about. And I kept saying on television, wait a minute, hold up. They ain't the only people working. Mm -hmm. Let's yeah. stop acting like they are. And the reality is, in a lot of these places, it's 90, 95, 98 percent white. They don't know any of us. They don't see us. And so they have these perceptions. They listen to conservative talk radio all day. They watch Fox News all day, which, which further amplifies that point of view. Of course. And, the, and then all of a sudden, you get a Trump. And then people begin to say, well, yeah, we've got to listen to their fears. And I'm going, if y'all broke, I could show you some folks in the inner city broke. Mm -hmm. You think you got bad schools? I can show you some bad schools. But in many ways, they're voting against their own interest. And then somehow saying, well, it's our fault. Well, I think it's always easier to transfer the blame and the critiquing to the other group. It's easier that way because it takes it off from you. Uh, I think that um, I really wish Martin Luther King was still here today. Um, you know, his strong teachings of love and, and understanding, and he used to say all the time, we can live together. We can respect each other. And his notion always was that 
he didn't think at all white people hated us because they loved to hate. He said so many of them perhaps would not hate us if they knew who we were. And I think that's where we've been derelict in our history and in our schools, not showing the contributions that we've been making. We've been contributing. Um, and yet you've got a segment of the population that you don't belong here. Before you know? SCLC, you worked with the National Urban League. Yes. Talk about that uh, and also you going undercover? Yes. <laughs> well, what happened is uh, I felt like, you know, I was really doing a, a lawless job, but it was, it was really a job of enjoyment, really. Because what had happened in Chicago at the time, and this was, I'm talking like the 50s, uh, they had good um, business people, uh, companies, and I'll just name a few. It doesn't matter to me. I hope I won't hurt it's you. It's all good. Uh, Marshall Field was a big uh, conglomerate. I mean, little girls grew up said, one of these days I'm going to Marshall Fields and get a pretty dress. You know, um, Marshall Fields was big, and uh, Spiegel's was a mail order, and, and Montgomery Ward were mail order uh, giants. And so they were good guys in terms of like contrib contributing with the NAACP dinner, mm -hmm. they'd buy tickets. But they wouldn't hire people. So the Urban League said, well, let's see if they really are good as they s pretend to be. And so what they started was a program to see when the one ads come out, like did Marsha Fields have some openings? If so, then I would go and we were always stationed in position about five minutes away from Marshall Field's office. And we called and said, I see, because back in the 50s, if you um, could type pretty mm -hmm. good and you could speak English, uh, you could get a job as a clerk typist. That was a good entry level job. Right. So they had some clerk typist positions. So Urban League said, okay, call. I called and said, is that job open? Oh yes, very nicely on the phone. Okay, I'm gonna come and apply. Hang the phone up. Less than five minutes, I'm there. And then, oh, gee, we just filled it. You know, you filled it in five minutes. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so I document the responses, right. and uh, that's where we would, we'd go to the major giants and kind of broke up that whole facade of we're good guys, but maybe not as good as we ought to be. Which, which, let, so I want to deal with that. I keep making the point to people, don't get confused by companies today who buy tables and make nominal contributions. Right. Uh, and in some cases, our organizations give, you know, will give them an award for, oh, you know, they, they bought a couple tables every year. Mm -hmm. When I say, hey, if you spend 5000 on tables, but then you won't put folks in executive suites, that means that we're we're losing out on one, two, three, four, five hundred thousand dollar jobs, and all we're getting for it is a measly couple of tables. Mm -hmm. and, and so it's it's amazing to me how that still happens today. And unfortunately, a lot of us will not demand that. No, no, wait a minute. If you're locking us out of high level paying jobs, if our black folks could actually have those jobs. They can buy the tables. Yeah, that's true. We have in our metropolitan paper here a section every Sunday of um, people who are moving up the ladder. Um, and they'll tell you who's in the news. Right. And they put nice pictures on there. And I've been monitoring this because I think I'm going to do something about it. Um, because too many Sundays, I mean, I've charted Sundays like I have right now uh, eight Sundays in a row. Mm -hmm not one black person. Um, the ones who get it were appointed to, let's say, they, they got a job on a, a committee. Mm -hmm. But I mean, those real serious jobs. That Power pay, jobs. Uh -huh, that pay good yes. and pay well, well, I'm not seeing enough presence. Now, maybe they can't put everybody in there, but I'm watching it because, you know, the perception is mm -hmm. half of what you get um, it becomes a reality to some people, and I don't want to accept that as my reality because I'm, I'm too active I'm, and I'm too important um, in my own thinking uh, to let something like that just slide by and you know, pretend like we don't notice it. But I'm noticing it, mm -hmm. and that doesn't mean, and I don't want to you know, just 
you know, just knock everybody down right now with that statement, but it doesn't look good for me to read that Sunday after Sunday that the jobs aren't there, the appointments are getting on committees, but that's not a good job. So what was the point when you decided to join SCLC? Well, I was married at the time to Ed Clayton, who was the editor of Jet Magazine, and had um, he had a great reputation of getting the job done. He was good at writing and everything. Martin at the time, we were living in Chicago, but Martin was here growing also. They'd moved from Montgomery to Atlanta. And he was feeling the growth. And he said, you know, we need publications. We need public relations. We need somebody to help with speeches. And so he just started asking as he traveled, you know, who's a good person? He said, Ed's name came up every place he went. He said, you probably can't get him. <laughs> uh, but he's pretty pricey, but he's the best. And so finally he said, uh, well, I'm going to call him. Well, Martin called. I had met Martin um, before this, but he was just, you know, a minister. He wasn't moving in the direction he ended up going. But um, he called Ed and uh, asked him uh, would he come down and give a look and see. And he said, but you don't have any money? He said, no, we don't have any money. Oh, you got the wrong guy. <laughs> <laughs> And so you probably was saying the same thing, like, yeah, uh, we're not working for yeah, free. Right, yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> and so he, um, and see, uh, fortunately, my husband made a good salary because Mr. Johnson, who owned Ebony and Jet and so forth, you know, believed him paid decent salaries. He didn't want his people to run to New York Times mm -hmm. and looking for better pay. So he paid good pay, um, I mean, uh, uh, good wages, and so we were living pretty comfortably. Uh, so he asked Paul to, uh, to I mean, Ed to come. And uh, he finally talked to me into coming. So he came to Atlanta to see what they're doing. And he came back home and said, you know, um, they're pretty serious down there. So those guys are committed to trying to make change. And he was impressed to the point that he said he'd give them a month. And so he came down here for a month, and then Martin wouldn't let him go. And in the meantime, uh, Coretta wanted to do concerts to raise money for SCLC but she couldn't get off the ground, and Ed said, I'll help you do that. And my wife is really good. Um, she'll help you also. So he and, and, and you like, oh, so you just volunteered me. <laughs> so, yeah, I was going to say, now he put me in the mix. <laughs> and so uh, the story goes now, so I ended up traveling with Coretta, and uh, then Ed was, you know, here. And uh, we stayed on one uh, to our first tour, as a matter of fact, was 11 days and nights. And she said that's enough to convince her that a woman can sleep together, eat together, and get along um, comfortably for 11 days and must be okay. <laughs> so she kind of liked me, and Martin is like an Ed, and they put the pinch to us to move to Atlanta. <laughs> but I tell people all the time, Martin really wasn't all that truthful because he said, if you'll just move, I'll get you a new house, a car, a housekeeper, a dog. And he promised me everything. He gave me <laughs> none of it. <laughs> so I said, Martin Luther King's a shyster. You know? <laughs> but it was kind of like the best move we've ever made. Mm -hmm. Would you, in, in terms of talking about those concerts, I mean, that, that is uh, a really, um, not, well, not misunderstood, but just not really well-known aspect in terms of really how the movement was funded. Because... People talk about, well, you know, he gave speeches and he gave the money back. They lived a very, very modest lifestyle. But those concerts helped pay for the SCLC, helped pay salaries. Oh, they, they were very successful. And she, you know, the, the, the nation now is beginning to embrace Martin Luther King. He was getting bigger all the time. And so when she would come on the scene, I mean, she's the wife of Martin Luther King. So they didn't get him, but they got her. So the concerts were well attended, well attended. So she was a big hit. And uh, they were feeling like they were touching Martin Luther King. And so it really was a good move for her. Mm -hmm. and, and so the two of you became very close. Yes. It, it had to have been difficult to be. I mean, look, he was young, but she was a young woman. Yeah. They get married. 
And goodness, he's rarely there. I mean, I, the books that I've read, I tell, I tell people all the time, and when you start looking at gone 18, 20, 22, 24, 26 days out of the month, you're seeing your, you're seeing your spouse two, three, if you're lucky, four days in a month. But let me tell you, um, without revealing a lot of uh, private information, the King family, old man King, we called him Daddy King uh, and Mama King, they were pretty strongly entrenched in the city, well-to-do, um, comfortable leaders and, and all of that. They had picked a girl for Martin to marry. Uh, he was off at Boston and Coretta had gone to the conservatory, so they were both in um, Boston at the time. And um, he's, he knew, Mark knew that the girl here was handpicked by the family and, uh, and he liked it. it was a very prominent family. And that was the person that they wanted for Martin. And Martin was going in that direction till he met Coretta. And I can tell you this, Roland, today and looking back and the other woman's a very fine person and she ended up you know, marrying well, but he chose the right person Coretta was a woman who was wed to the cause. She not only married him, but she married his mission. And so she accepted his absences. Um, she was so organized. Like when we were on the road, uh, she'd call back home to her housekeeping staff and say, you know, uh, Dexter has uh, uh, reading lessons at two and Bernice has to go here and Yolanda has to go there, be sure they keep their appointments and somebody get them there. She was running the house from afar. Now, Dr. King didn't like for her to travel that much and she didn't travel as much as she wanted to, but he said one of us has to stay home with these children. So he was very strongly committed to somebody being there. But she didn't stay away long and she would plan her absences more when he, she knew he was going to be home. But it worked out very well, but she was committed to that cause. His cause became hers, and she kept it to the, her end, his end and her end. You talk about being married to the movement when I was talking to Merle Evers Williams. She, she, at Dick Gregory's funeral, she said, she said, the public really doesn't know this just really unique relationship that existed between her, Coretta Scott King, and Betty Shabazz. And she was just talking, and she was just saying, you know, see, folks have no idea we would get a call and be like, look, I'm sick of this. I'm leaving him. And we, she said, we've been on the phone going, no, you're not. Mm -hmm. Just go ahead, just blow your steam off. And she was just saying how it, it was just that, that, that the three of them shared something that other people had no idea about. And then when you began to talk, talk about the other folks in the movement, whether it was Andrew Young, whether it was Jose Williams, whether it was, I mean, you go down the line, the spouses literally were in this thing together. It, 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 it became their lives. Exactly. It wasn't just a job. And they were all wore it so well. You know, I knew them all. And um, they wore the mantle of uh, leadership in the absence of their husbands so well. Um, and I had nothing but admiration and respect for all of them because they all had families, you know, three and four children uh, to the family. And um, they carried on extraordinarily well. When you were working there and you're in the middle of this, did you ever say, we really are changing the world? Or was it just we're just going through it day by day. Oh no, you knew you were making change. Uh, I remember, um, and you told me how you just interviewed Reverend C.T. Vivian. Um, I remember so well how he was on the steps of the courthouse, he and some other people pleading to come in just to register mm -hmm. to vote, just to register to vote. And he was beaten severely in the blood. And I see that footage sometimes. I said, we ought to play it every election. The blood running down his face, just trying to register. And then we fast forward and we get a voting rights bill. 
um, the right to vote. Now, what bothers me in all of that is that, you know, I still hear people should, it looks like rain. I heard it may rain, so I may not go. Oh. And so I just, just, I'm telling you, I just shiver in my boots. And this year just really blew my whole mind. I had no idea that this year, I thought we were doing better each year when I found out that this election, this last major national election, that we had one of the lowest turnouts we've had in many of them. In 20 years, black it, turnout. I, I, I couldn't lowest believe in it. Lowest in two decades. I couldn't believe it. I don't know how anybody could stay in bed on election day. But I said, if they see the footage of Reverend C.T. Vivian and the people who helped get us to this point now where you can go. See, we, it didn't matter whether it rained or not. You didn't have no place to go, so you didn't have to get up. <laughs> and now you can't even get up now because you can. It bothers me greatly. People don't vote. But the changes were so apparent. You know, uh, I, I, I felt every change. I felt a, a proud of it and a little bit of the ownership of it. Mm -hmm. Thinking back to just the different touch points, the different on the, on the timeline, um, which one of those moments really jumps out at you? Um, was it a bill? Was it March? Was it a speech? Was it uh, a death? Was it where where, where you where where you, where you think back and and you go, man? I was a part of that? No, there was not one. Uh, I go back to each moment um, and relive it. Um, while the description of the moment would vary, um, the pain, the suffering, the pride, the joy, the angst, all of those moods are the same. Uh, I remember uh, going to Jackson, uh, Mississippi, just for a convention, and one of my many jobs was to pick up the special guests who were coming in. And I went to the airport, and um, there was Mrs. Parks, uh, who didn't have anybody to pick her up, because, you know, these were chauvinistic days also, <laughs> uh, so women were second. Um, and. Uh, I said, oh, Mrs. Parks, I didn't have, you know, any information to pick her up. I didn't know she's on that flight. And I said, listen, you, I have to pick you up, so you just wait right here. I'm, I'm coming to pick somebody else up. So she, while we were waiting, she said, you know, um, I didn't bring the right clothing. Uh, you know, I get kind of cold in these air-conditioned environments. So." Uh, you think you could find me a wrap? And I said, oh, of course. I said, there's a store right a block from the hotel where we're staying. And I'll go there and get your wrap. As soon as we get in, I'll go get you something. And sure enough, I did. I went to the store, had money in my pocket, and uh, uh, found a nice wrap I thought would serve a purpose. Saw so the lady, uh, the waitress, I mean, not the, the clerk, um, she was busy. And I thought she was just busy dis with the display shelf. And I thought she saw me because I was the only person there. But she didn't stop. And finally I said, Miss, do I get her attention? She looked around, didn't stop. So I said, Miss, I, I, I'm ready for my purchase. And she said, you know, you people make me sick. You, all, you know you don't belong here. Now, we got the Public Accommodations Act, so I, I did belong there. But she said, you know, you people, and that's another thing that gets you, you people. Uh, I said, Miss, I have money to pay for this item, and I'd like to pay for it. Oh, the exasperation just took over. Oh, you people just make me sick. Well, I could have dealt with that. You know, I could have argued with her and fought mm -hmm. with her. But I went there to buy something, had the money, paid for it, and walked out. And on the way back, here I hear again, you don't belong here, you know. I um, found every step of the way I was running into that. And I just said, you know, when the law comes, has it really made a difference? No, because the law doesn't change every person's right. attitude. It just now gives you the right 
to belong there. So I was in the right place because I belong there. But I haven't changed her heart. And Dr. King said so effectively, until and unless you change a man's heart, you may never change his behavior. So we got to change their hearts in order to change their behavior. So we hadn't gotten to her then. Um, but uh, I knew then that that law was going to make it okay for me to belong there. I may not be treated right, but I belong there. Was there any point where you, where you were scared, this is over for me? Uh, not really. Um, because I um, was looking for a home. Mahalia Jackson, who was very famous, um, gospel singer, well known, um, wanted to buy another house she owned. She wasn't moving, she just wanted another house. Saw this house, and so she told me in my movements would I um, look for something for her. Well, I was in California, just the house that I knew she would like, and had a sign out front for sale. And I just went up and rang the doorbell and uh, asked the man the silly question, like, is the house for sale? <laughs> 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 I guess he said, can you read? But it was a kind of an odd everything, because yes, I could read, and it did say for sale, and he said it wasn't sale, he had just sold it, you know. Well, I said, well, why don't you move the sign? Well. Now you're going to have an argument, and then you've got to fight on your heads. You keep going every day. It's not over yet, Roland. Uh, even today we got the laws, and I was there when a lot of them were passed. I've seen them and worked through it and fought through it and helped ownership of some of the legislation. But we haven't changed everybody's heart yet, so I still went into it. Um, and so there's not a moment where you saw, you saw up close the personal toll it took. Um, it was a lot for civil rights leaders to have to carry. How did they deal with just all of that? Laughter, music, camaraderie. Was it, even in those cases, still that private pain when you read books and you hear them talk about Dr. King and, 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 and depression? I read, this one is reading Nick Cott's book on Judgment Days, and he wrote about him and LBJ, these two iconic figures and what they personally battled. I've talked to others, and they talked about, the, for many of them, there were, there, were, there were lonely moments as well. These are folks who were in their 20s who were changing the world. That's a lot to bear. Well, but you know, I was very close to Dr. King. I used to hear he just loved uh, President Johnson. They had a nice love affair up to a certain point. But Martin, and I can call him that, uh, you know, I know this is a public program, but uh, I feel a kinship to him because we had a close relationship. But um, he was a composite of all that. He had some moments that were lonely. Every, every week on a Tuesday morning, um, he took time off. He had a, uh, a location that was secret, and he would go there and just get in his pajamas and stay all day. and commune with nature and commiserate about, you know, what he's planning to do, would like to do. But he did it alone. He was there all day. And the only time we would intrude is like he would call and ask me to, say, bring him some lunch. Or um, he had some papers that had to be signed. We'd take them to him, but didn't bother him on those personal days. He was gathering his thoughts and just communing. Um, and yet, I saw a different kind of lonely, and that he was alone. He wasn't lonely, he was alone on those prescribed dates. But I saw him near the end of his life. He died a very depressed man. 
because he had made um, that speech about Vietnam. April 4th, 1967, yes, Riverside exactly. Church, Beyond exactly. Vietnam. Uh -huh. And it seemed like his world shut down. People stopped giving, even his friends who you could count on for money, just dried up. Black folks. Oh, yes. Approval and numbers he low. he said, um, you know, I, I think he couldn't get a handle on it. He just said, I can understand your enemies not supporting you. They don't believe in you anyway. But your friends? He said, I thought everybody who knew me knew that I couldn't cope with war. You know, there is no victory in war, he used to say. And when you saw those children on the TV in Vietnam, he said, now I've got to speak. You know, children being bombed with that napalm stuff. He said, I've got to do something. And he then spoke out and lost, lost everybody. And it really, really bothered him to the very end. And if you remember reading, on his last birthday, uh, he was here in Atlanta and they were having a meeting over at Ebenezer Church planning a strategy for the next movement. And there was a film crew here um, to just follow him, doing a documentary on him for Italy television. And um, they called me, they meaning Andy Young and uh, Reverend Abinez and all of them called and said, you know, we haven't seen him laugh for a long time. And we've just decided you're the only person who we think can make him laugh. So will you come over to the church at a certain time uh, and let's just have his, today was his birthday. And I said, oh, I need a little more time. He waited, not making the story too long, I agreed to go. Mm -hmm. When the meeting broke, he started out to the men's room and said, hey, Doc, come back. Now the uh, television crew is getting all of this, you know, because they're following his movements. So he sat down and I said, listen, this is your birthday. And so I pulled out of a little sack I had, a little tin cup that was gold, but it was the biggest cup of people used to call it. And he said, I said to him, you're always trying to help President Johnson with the war on poverty. So I want you to take this cup and go stand on the corner wherever you travel <laughs> and get some money for President Johnson. And he just doesn't smile, he laughs. He laughs. And I said, and also, you go to jail so much, I'm gonna give you these potato chips. So the next time you go, you'll have something to snack on and he falls out laughing. <laughs> well, well, when they got ready to do a movie on him after his death, they couldn't find any footage of him laughing. And so this footage became the most valuable footage. It is now still used. They use it as on the prize and use it now for lots of things. But it was the first time he had laughed on his countenance for months. He died of a broken heart because he could not understand how people couldn't support his view on Vietnam, killing people. Now I tell you that story because uh, the man was mixed with, he was such a humorist. I mean, in private, there's nobody funny. I even said to him one time, I said, you know, you don't have to worry about the future and a job. When you solve all the problems of the world, you can go on stage by being a comedian. He was the funniest man ever. Everybody agreed to that. Those who were privileged to be in private moments with him. Uh, he'd tell a joke and get an inflection, just like the one story he's telling. And he was very, very, very funny. Um, Phil was humor, loved to play. He'd come home from a trip and his, he and his children, the first thing he wanted to do was play with the kids. And they had an awful game that Mrs. King just couldn't stand. And the game was they'd pull up a chair, the little ladder, climb on top of the refrigerator. And then the game goes, Martin's on the floor and they're leaping <laughs> into his arms. Now that's real faith that your dad's gonna catch you. And they had a kiss spot, you know, with four children, everybody had a spot. And he would catch the kid and then kiss him and always he'd kiss the wrong spot. Daddy, no, daddy, that's the wrong spot. Oh, and then they'd have a fight over the wrong spot. And they would just fill the kitchen with laughter. Mrs. King, if I could, she'd be gonna kill themselves. But I saw in that picture faith in their father, faith that they could leap down and he would catch them. Having the father in the house playing the game, getting 
the kiss spots. That was more pleasure for him than it was for them. It was pleasure for all. So to see him in the years that he lived filled with the laughter and then see him go out of the world with the sadness bothers me. You mentioned that last year. Um, again, I've watched numerous documentaries, read numerous books. And I, I tell people, I don't care what anyone tells me. There is no coincidence that he dies on April 4th, 1968. That, that, a that, year to the day. That, there was something. After giving that speech. That. He was troubled for a few years over Vietnam. Diane Nash, James Bevel, and others were pushing him on it. Um, did he ever talk with you or would you listen to the debates back and forth as he struggled with that issue? Because he had to have known the moment he took that stance, he's opposing LBJ. He's opposing me. He's laying it all on the line once he says enough is enough with this war. Well, I had a chance to be around him, kind of know his thinking. And so I'll go out on the limb by saying I think he did. Because he reached points in his life where, well, whatever I lose, I lose. I've got to take the stand. He was willing to take the stand that he felt was the right position on an issue, regardless. Uh, it didn't matter to him what the consequences were at the time he's going to take the stand. So I knew that he probably knew that there was going to be a price to pay. I don't think he knew the extent the price was. I don't think he knew that everybody was going to turn against him. And he takes this stance, and his wife has no choice but to go along with it, and his decision has a direct impact on her and their children. Oh, yeah. Because he put it all on the line. Well, but he told her, and see, I drove him to the airport to go to Memphis, but he said to me that he felt like the country was at a point now where it was not ready for change. That all the change we've made is about all we're going to get. And so when he comes back from Memphis, he said, when I come back from this trip, Coretta and I are going to take a year off to go to India again. We got to retool. That wasn't his language. But he said, we've got to start again. Now, what was the problem with that is that SCLC was already in the planning stages for the Poor People's Campaign. Poor People's Campaign. His idea. Mm -hmm. But he told me he wasn't going to go, he was going to abandon the idea. He was leaving when he came back. He was going to India. Now, there are those who differ. I don't say that a lot. As a matter of fact, I'm taking a stand now to tell you this on television because I didn't express that to everybody because I saw it wasn't well received. Uh, but that's the truth. And so I'm telling you now the truth. Uh, the planners of the uh, march didn't want to hear it because there was, you know, you got to have some movement after he's no longer here. You got to have some uh, action field programmatic thrust. Otherwise, you're going to die. Uh, so that was a, a bold statement, but he told it to me. Now, I have no way of knowing whether he really meant it. I believe he meant it because uh, he didn't joke a lot about his plans. I think he meant it. He said, the country now is not right for what we're doing, and I've got to make a switch. You dropped him off at the airport, and he gets out. As you think back, as you think back, have you, I'm sure you have, have you just went back and just played every part of that? What he had on, what he said, last look, all of those things. Because that was the last time you saw him alive. Yeah. Well, let me tell you what happened. The day before uh, I was at their home, 
um, Mrs. King was convalescing from uh, recent illness, and um, she was there. Mother-in-law, well, Martin's mother was there, Martin and I. And after dinner, we were playing the piano. He, you know, he's a great singer, and I played the piano. He said, I bet you didn't know I could sing. I said, well, I heard you could. No, I didn't know you could. He said, well, I know you can play. So sit on the piano. She majored in music in college. Yeah, yeah. So um, we had such fun. Uh, we were singing and, oh, just having a great time. When we separated, the evening ended, I went home and told him I'd pick him up the next morning, whatever time established. But Mama King called me that night about 11.30, and she said, you know, I know you're taking ML to the airport tomorrow, but tell him something for me. I said, just like that fun we had today, I'd like to have more days like that. I know. I'm the mother and I have to understand he's busy, but you see to it and tell him I want him to plan more fun time for family hour. Will you do that for me? I said, of course. Well, I told him, I said, now your mother called me and I told her she, she wants more, more of your time and we're going to see that you do that. Well, guess what? About four, three or four o'clock Atlanta time, because uh, Memphis was an hour behind us, he called her, talked to her about an hour and a half. She said it never happened before. Could you take your mother for granted? He knew she was going to be there. She was supportive of her. The son loved him dearly, but he didn't bother to call her. But she, when I saw her that first time that night, because I went over to check on them, she said, listen, when this pain subsides a little bit, I'm going to tell you how much I appreciate what you did. Because he told me you told him what I said, and that prompted him to call. And they had a big laugh about, you know, here's the call. And um, he knew, I think, because he called his brother. He had never done that before. Called him on the phone, I understand, talked a good time with him. He did a lot of odd things. I talked to him, and he said to me, uh, why does my room number sound so familiar to you? I mean, to me, he said. And I said, I don't know, because I don't know what room you're in, because he had switched hotels. And he said, it's 306. And I said, well, that's my house number. And I said, you've been here enough, so I guess you make it the relationship. That all of these things were odd things that happened that day. April 4th. Uh-huh. It was early in the day uh, he called me. And, um, and then he called his mother, called his brother, and Andy said they were playing pillow talk, I mean a pillow throwing, whatever. After he came back from court, yeah, came in and, and they played, had a pillow fight. Uh-huh, yeah. And so he did a lot of things uh, that day that were unusual, I understand. I wasn't there, I was here. Um, but he did a lot of unusual things, a lot of unusual things. Oh, i tell you something else that was most unusual. Coretta's favorite uh, gift is red roses. And every birthday, her birthday's in April, uh, April uh, 27th is her birthday. Um, now, he left on, was, was March, I guess, when he left Atlanta. Mm -hmm. uh, he bought her some artificial flowers and left them in the library of the house. And he told her to go get the flowers. And uh, no, he, he told the housekeeper to tell her when he leaves, go get those flowers out of the library. She was angry. She, he said, did you get those roses? So she said, yes, but I'm mad about it. He said, why? He said, because they're artificial. And guess what he said to her? I didn't know whether I would be here on your birthday or not, but I wanted your roses to be here. Now, he died, that was April 4th. Well, that was April 3rd when he talked to her. Her birthday is April 27th. Mm. He said, I don't know whether I would be there in person for your birthday, so, but here are your red roses, you know. She kept those roses a long time. Mm -hmm. 6.01 p.m., April 4th, shots ring out. 
how do you find out? I was having dinner with the Grand Dragon of the Ku Klux Klan. And the Mater D knew my relationship with the Kings, and she came over to the table and gave me a note. Well, we were talking, I was busy talking, and she said, did you hear about Dr. King? And I just folded up the note and kept talking. She thought that was odd. She came back a second time. She said, I hate to interrupt your meal. She said, but I just heard on the radio he'd been shot. Well, that didn't bother me either because I'd been in his presence before when it was reported. We were in Los Angeles once they reported that he had been shot. And we were in there getting ready for a nice, comfortable evening and a meal. Well, not just he and I, but you know, several of us were. Again, we had a big laugh about it that they said, I think the guy had had eight sticks of dynamite and said, I think I got him, you know. We saw it on TV. So I didn't think anything about it. I just talked to him earlier that hopes. day. And, you know, so he was all right then. And I said, well, maybe I better go to the phone. I went to the telephone and their private lines were busy. And that's unusual, all the lines to be busy. And I said uh, to my guests, I think I better go over there. So I then drove over and as I was getting to her driveway, she was backing out. The mayor was there and the police. They were taking her to the airport. And she said, oh, I've been trying. She left the window down, it was raining. She said, I've been trying to reach you. Uh, I've got to go to Memphis, said. And um, she had a housekeeping staff, but she knew I had a special relationship with the children. She said, will you check on the children for me. I don't know what's going to happen. Because see, when they called her, they didn't, <clears throat> they didn't tell her he was killed. They told her he'd been shot and injured. So when you're driving up, you still think it's not true? Well, I think something must have happened. Right. Once, as, so I said, I but as you're driving happened. over, you're going, okay, we've heard this before. Let me drive over. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. But then yeah. when you turn that corner and then you see yeah. police and the mayor, that's when it hits you. Just something, okay, something, happened. something did happen. Mm -hmm. And so <clears throat> you pull up, she rolls the window down, but she doesn't know that he's gone. That's right. She didn't know. And it wasn't until she got to the airport that she got the call that, and I think the mayor got the call, that he is gone. And so um, Martin's secretary was there at the airport to join her. And they went to the ladies' room, and that's when she got the real official word. And then she came back home. Mm -hmm. So you're in the house with the children. And I stayed. I didn't leave there until five days later, six days later. Mm -hmm. You know he's gone. Did you wait for her to return to tell them? Were they made aware, the children? Oh, I would never not even consider telling the children. Um, she came shortly, shortly, I guess, you know, after, well, I guess they could speed, but she came. It didn't take her long to get to the house, and she came in telling her staff and everybody. And by now, the house is filling up because everybody else now has heard. But she said to her staff, do not tell my children. I'll do that myself. And so her bedroom was at the end of the long hall in the house. So she decided to make that her solace. And then people up front would answer the phone and then direct the call back uh, to see if she would take and I'd be the interceptor. I just stayed with her. But she got ready to go tell the boys and she asked me to go with her. And she had a death grip on my arm. I mean tightly trying to tell the children. She told Dexter first, the younger boy, that, you know, your dad has been seriously hurt. She couldn't bring herself to, she couldn't bring herself. She said, uh, your dad has been hurt. Well, how badly is he hurt? She said, pretty badly, I understand. Um, but um, um, we'll talk about it later, but you know, he's not coming home, and uh, I've got a lot of things to do. And he finally, he said, well, if he's hurt, but he jumped out of his bed, he said, if he's hurt badly, why are you still here? You all do everything together. Why are you still here? And he was chastising her. 
And she said, oh, well, you know, got a lot of decisions to make. And she was calm and still holding me so tightly. And then we went to the other side of the room, which was the other boy's side, Martin. And she told him, oh, uh, he was older, so she said, uh, he's, it's pretty serious. And um, so we got a lot of decisions to make. I don't know what we're going to do first, but looks like he's very, very serious. She still can't say. She couldn't say it. She couldn't say it. And he said, um, well, what must I tell my children, I mean, my friends at school tomorrow? So she said, well, you know, you're not going to go to school, uh, so you won't have to worry about that. And he leaped up. What do you mean? I have to go to school, Miss Davis. Said there'll be no cutting her glasses. And I, I laughed later, not at that moment, but I said, that teacher put <laughs> cut these glasses. But uh, she finally got out of the room, and, and then she had a sigh of relief, you know, that she finally told them. Now, Bernice was too little. She was only like four, I think, and didn't understand. But Yolanda came in, and she sat on her mother's bed right beside her, and they embraced crying like we're big girls we're not gonna cry daddy wouldn't want us to cry so we're not gonna cry mommy we're gonna pull this thing together the two of us can do this and they are wailing the most poignant moment that was a difficult moment for me and I guess I was crying too because they were just embracing tightly saying we're not gonna cry we're not going to cry. Um, but what? So they finally said, "Okay, we're going to we're going to work this thing out." As the calls were coming in, assume Mrs. King would want to talk to the president, um, and so you know, you know his voice. So I would take the call and said, "Okay, Mrs. King, this is President Johnson." But what was interesting, everybody had the same message. And it's the same one maybe you and I make, like someone dies and said, if I can do anything, let me know. And meeting it, you know, anything you need me to do, let me know. If there's anything I can do, mm -hmm. everybody had the same message except one call. Kennedy. Um, Robert, Robert Kennedy. Kennedy. His call was the one that was different. He said, Mrs. King, it's obvious. Now, when he called, it was, now see, in Atlanta, it was about five or six-ish, uh, and people started calling. And uh, so up until now, it's almost 10. Mr. Kennedy said, um, it's obvious, Mrs. King, that um, you need more telephone lines because I've been trying to get you ever since the news broke. But Mr., and I'll make up a name because I don't remember the name, but Mr. John Jones is en route to Atlanta now to install nine telephone lines for you. He'll be there at 12.30 tonight. He's en route now. I also heard on the TV that you'd perhaps want to go pick your husband up in Memphis. So we've dispatched a plane. It's already there in Atlanta. The pilot's name is Sam Smith, uh, tailgate number 12345, telephone number 8.2. So whenever you want to go, all you have to do is make this call. He will take you, and he's in readiness whenever you want to go to Memphis. Also, who's your point person? She told I was going to be her lead spokesperson. And he said, Zernona call every hotel in the city of Atlanta, talk to the management, and put a clamp on all the rooms in the hotel, I mean in the city, that people will be coming to this room who are heads of states and we got to be sure we have right allocation of space. And my team will be there tomorrow morning, and we're going to set up an office at 123 Maple Street. And we will help govern things. Uh, he just chum, 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 lay everything out. And we followed his rules. I mean, Because he, he had been through it. Mm -hmm. He said, we know how. We've 
got experience in this. We know what we're doing. And he was right. Yeah. And I was there when uh, Jacqueline Kennedy came, which was the expected moment. Two, two things happened. I mean, you got time for me to tell all yeah. of this? Uh, before I tell you about Mrs. Kennedy, I'm going to tell you about Nixon. He was the he wasn't president at that point. He was the Republican candidate. Yeah, the candidate. Mm -hmm. Repub he called our newspaper publisher and said, "I know Dr. King's feelings on me, but do you think you could help arrange for me to come uh, visit Mrs. King? My wife and I want to come make a call on her." And he said, "No, I can't do it, but." I've got a very good friend who's at her house, and he was talking about me, and she will tell me whether you can or not, so let me get in touch with her, and then I'll call you back. So he called me, and I said, I don't know, I have to run it by her. Well, when I told her that in the house there were people who said, oh, no, you know, Dr. King would want to see him, and, uh, and so they talked to her, saying, no, why don't you say no? Well, I had her last ear, so I said, Mrs. King, this is not a time for politics. Why don't you let him come, but let's lay some ground rules. Mm -hmm. No entourages, no press, no nothing. Just come. If he's making a personal call, then he personally can call on her. So she bought my advice and agreed. Called Mr. McGill and told him and said we wanted him to come unannounced. And sure enough, he came. But guess what happened? He drove, he came up, and we knew what time. They told us all the way. He's at the airport now. He's on his way. So we knew when to expect him. And when he came here, I went to the door, the front of the house. He came in a beige, I don't know, cars, but like also a Chevrolet, something like that. It wasn't a fan, but I don't want to offend anybody, but it was a small <laughs> car. And um, I ushered him in. Well, he was by himself, but he said, you know, Mrs. Nixon was coming, but he said they got a call that one of the girls got sick and she had to rush to New York. He said, but, so he sat by her bed, but that's where she received her gift. She said, on her bed, we had a chair, and he sat there face to face and told him he knew how Dr. King felt. He said, but this is not a political call. My wife and I were coming, and he went on to tell why she knew him. He said, I have brought with me a check, a personal check, that we are feeling um, the grief, and because we are Americans, we have to take some responsibility for this. So as our personal expression of sympathy, we want to educate all four of your children. And this check that we have here will cover their expenses wherever they go. There's enough money to educate all four children. Nobody knows that story because I haven't told it for a few times. Then we were told that Mrs. Kennedy was coming and then the day she was due, she said she couldn't make it. Then we got another call. She said, now she does want to come. She said, I don't have the strength to make it. Because she, had, she, had she, she knew the pain of Coretta Scott King. You're getting my script ahead of me. Because what happened is she finally came. And as I said, you know, describing, you can get the picture of the house. The front door was up there. Coretta's bedroom was at the end of the hall. When she came, they told me she was here, so I went to greet her to bring her back. Roland, those two women didn't say one word to each other, verbal word, no word. Neither said hello. They didn't say anything. They embraced that seemed like 20 minutes. Of course, it wasn't that long. But they embraced without a spoken word for an endless period of time. But you don't have to be smart to read their lips and their heart. The heart was saying, we know what, what you're feeling. You know, I know, we know. That was the most pointed moment. And it was the one time that I cried because I was feeling their language. Uh, it has me hard for you because here you are. You go to the home. You're with the kids. She comes back. 
she asks you to be with her when she tells the children. You have to be her rock. Oh yeah. So you you can't grieve. You you can't break down. You can't. You're taking the phone calls. You're doing. So how are you? Did you just sort of just go like kidded Robert Candy? You just went right into work mode. Oh yeah, because I, you know, I'm, I'm not even sure that I ever cried. Come to think of it, I'm saying later, but I never got a chance to grieve uh, because one of the things when she was trying to decide whether she's going to go to Memphis, and you know, then right away I said, oh gee, she needs clothes because I wanted her to look nice. She's going to be photographed wherever she goes. So the the next morning now we were up or the the night went into morning. So by morning time, I told her I was going to go down and get some clothes. And um, I did. I went to a little nice little shop downtown Atlanta um, that had nice clothing. And I told the man that I've come to pick some things for Mrs. King. I have no money. Uh, I wouldn't dare take time to ask her for a credit card. And I don't have any money, so will you trust me to pick what I think she wants? take it home, and if she likes them, we'll keep them, and I'll come back and pay. If not, I'll bring the clothing back. And he agreed to those terms. Well, I picked out a lot of stuff. Came home. As I was getting into the house, I had a man there who helped me because I had all these clothing. In the lobby, I mean, in the foyer of their home, were Bella Fonte and Stan Levinson and Stan Levinson was the Jewish friend who'd mm -hmm. been with him a long time. Very close advisor, Dr. Uh -huh, King. Exactly. And uh, said, what are you doing? I said, oh, I wanted to look nice. So I bought a lot of clothes. And I told them the story. I didn't have no money. And they said, well, we wanted to look nice, too. And we know you know what she would look good in. They both gave me a credit card. I said, here, we don't care what you buy. Buy what you think you want for her. Here are the cards to pay for them. So when I came home, when I saw her uh, later on, um, after the, the people subsided, um, she looked at my stuff and liked everything I brought. And I said, oh, I can go back empty head. <laughs> so I said, and I told her the story, I had money. Because she said to give me a credit card. I said, oh, no, I got two credit cards. <laughs> I went back, and guess what the owner of the store said? Um, mm, you got a balance here? I thought he had lost his mind. <laughs> I'm the same one who just left it with all your clothes. And he said to me, I gotta come to pay for them. He said, listen, I'm a white man in America. And I have to take some of the responsibility of having the climate that created this. So the least I can do is cover the cost of the clothing. You have a zero balance. You know? And I had also designed her headdress. And I uh, had gone down to um, our department store, which was Macy's at the time. And um, we had a laugh because they asked me what time was I coming. And I said, well, I don't know. Uh, I was so busy, I don't, I don't have a schedule. I don't know. He said, well, it doesn't matter. We'll stay here till you get here. The store closes at 5. So if you're not here, I said, can you? find the back door, and I laughed. I said, I'm black. I know where all the back doors are. <laughs> <laughs> so he said, you leave the back door open, and I can come through the back door. Sure, if that's what, because the store was closed, I went through the back door and told the lady, this is what I think I want. I had never designed anything either, so I said, this is what I think I want. Um, and so uh, the lady agreed uh, to, you know, do it up, and I said, and don't stitch it, just kind of baste it so, you know, she's got to approve it and she may not like it. And um, it was the time except for when the daughter came in and I saw her cry. She never shed a tear. That woman was just strong, making decisions and moving, never cried after the, that. But when she tried on the headdress, then she looked in the mirror. And I'm sure she's saying that this is what I'm wearing to my husband's funeral. And she broke down that time. But those are the only times she cried the whole time in that whole long week. It was a week-long um, 
that was the week that was, I'll just call it that. They say rose in a fistic glove. Mm -hmm. When you went to the airport, you accompanied her to the airport? To pick when his body was returned from? No, no. Oh, I didn't see the body until, uh, let me tell you that story, because the day he was ready for viewing, because uh, I've been doing a myriad of things, you know. Um, while they had announced that there was going to be a public viewing at 11 o'clock, um, at that moment we were at the church. Uh, Coretta had to make some final uh, revisions to the program. Um, and so she went over to the church and the security guard called her over there to say, Miss King, what must we do? said, there are thousands of people lined up here to see the body. And so what must we do? And she said, oh, and it had begun a misting rain. And the, you know, the worst kind of rain is a, a mist. It just falling on you. Uh, she was such a kind, considerate, compassionate woman. She said, oh, well, let them let go on in. And I said, no, Coretta, you should see him first. And I said, the, the public will wait, but you need to see him first. And what good advice that was, because once we finished the church, we went over to view. And I was, you no, know, Harry Belafonte and his wife and I were the only non-family members, everybody else, it's a large family. And I saw them when, he, when they came in, I stepped aside and Coretta came down and she had a faint, a faint response, oh, like she was gonna collapse. When I walked up to the beer, he looked awful. It looked as if someone had gone and just dug up a big glob of clay and whoop, slapped it upside his face. I was horrified. So I stepped over quietly to the mortician and said, Sir, is there anything you can do to the side of his face? He crashly said, Miss, his jaw was blown off. That's the best I could do. I was shocked. Loudly in the Loudly. presence Coretta of the family? Coretta and could hear. Oh, I was so, so angry with him. And I finally said, forget him. And I said, something has to be done because he looked horrible. I mean, this big old glob of stuff. And um, so Coretta and I, they're sitting down. Oh. I looked at Mama King, that's the mother, who's dark-skinned. And then I saw Belafonte's wife, who was white. And I, uh, back in those years, women always carried loose powder. And I was hoping that's, that they had some. And I said, Mama King, you got any powder? She said, oh, yeah. She gave me her powder, which was dark. Julie, do you have some? And she said, yes. Hers was white. So I took the two and stood over the casket looking at Martin's face and making myself a little roux of a mixture, Belafonte came over, took his handkerchief, and put it around Martin's neck. And so I'm dabbing to see what I've got here, trying to match the other side of his face to get a balance to it. And I finally got it. And Coretta smiled. And so I'm brushing the excess off of Martin's face and Belafonte and I never knew what happened to the handkerchief. It was his handkerchief he had taken out of his pocket. Um, and the excess, you know, we folded it up. But he was to stay there till midnight, and then we were moving him to the church uh, for another viewing at 3 a.m. And so I did it again because the body oxidizes with air. And uh, so I went and did it again, so I did it three times. Uh, before the actual funeral. How did you maintain that level of composure in those days after? Well, I saw a need and I filled it. And I hear people describing me today, I think that's the way I am, you know. Um, I didn't feel anything except I was glad I thought of that. Um, I don't, you know, I didn't have any experience, so I don't know why I did it. I can't 
give you all those answers like what made me do it, you know, I don't know. Uh, that's the only thing I could think of. I knew I needed to do something. I couldn't have this. Martin is somebody we loved and we wanted him to look good. And incidentally, uh, morticians from around the country, the National Association called me. The president of the National, Bob Miller from Chicago, very famous, said to me, we are ready to come to Atlanta. All of us, if need be, we want him to look good. We want to come and process him. Can you get permission for us to come in? And of course, I couldn't get permission because Daddy King was very loyal. This mortician was, had been a member of the church, and he didn't want him to, to deny him that opportunity. And I was sorry because the, the people who had real experience would have done a better job even than what I did. Mine was a makeshift stuff. They would have done it better from the beginning, you know. And, and, and I remember that. But I didn't give it any thought. Uh, I didn't know what I was doing. Uh, there was no prerequisite for this. There was no book that tells you to do that, no recipe. I just did it, and it worked. Were you with her when Lerone Bennett came in and said, Mrs. King, they're not going to let Ebony and Jet into the pool photography area to shoot the funeral? And according to him, she said, send word. If Ebony is not allowed, no one will be allowed. That's right. Yes, I was. When you describe that, just because now we know, if it, without that, Moneta Sleep does not shoot that photo. That's right. And does not become the first African American to ever win a Pulitzer Prize. That's right. Well, but you know what? It was not unusual. I've been with Coretta in so many circumstances. That was just Coretta. Uh, that didn't even seem like it was a difficult decision. You know, we who are black believed in Johnson Publishing, Ebony and Jen, all that it represented. So I had something similar, you know, with the Trump Awards, they're going to monitor the president. The black press couldn't come in. Oh, just no way could that happen. Um, you just knew that would not happen. So it was easy for her to say, no way. Oh, yeah, they're coming in here. And so, but to know her, that was not, that, that was not atypical either. You know, uh, she would just make sure. And her senses were always sharp, always sharp. That film did not dull her senses. She knew everything that was going on. She described for you everybody was there. She could tell you everybody came to that house. She could tell you. She could tell you everything. You know, she was an unusual woman, unusual woman. Being on the SEC, LCLC staff, he's assassinated. He's buried. Here was the guy who, and obviously not by himself, kept it together. You get it. You had Andy Young, executive director. You had Ralph oh, yeah. Abernathy. But as you, what did you observe? What, just what was it like as they're as you're all trying to move forward? And he's gone. And they're still trying to do poor people's campaign. And there are riots across the country. And black America is in this just collective pain. Well, I have to be honest with you, I cannot tell you um, what I thought and what I said. Um, it would be crashless of me to do that, so I, I won't say. Uh, but those of us who were supporters and involved members of the community and those who cared about our future knew we were going to have some difficult days now without him. Uh, because one of the things I even tell young people today uh, that Martin Luther King didn't do anything without a plan. Nothing. Um, he had uh, five men um, who he considered his battery of advisors. And he'd call them in to say, I'm. Who are those five? Oh, I don't want to. I don't want to. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, I read enough to know. But, but, but here's the thing, it's written someplace, so yeah. I guess I could, but I don't want to. 
um, he would call them in. And these were people who didn't tell him what he liked to hear. To, what do you think? They'll say, this is what I think. And if it disagree with him, that just so be it. But that's why he picked them, because they would tell him what they thought he ought to do. And that's what he appreciated about them. But he would tell them at the end of every meeting, uh, gentlemen, appreciate your time. But I'm going to mull over everything you've said, call all the thoughts. Then I will make a decision. It may not be what you recommend it, but I will make a decision. And I will stand by my decision, good, bad, or indifferent. That's what Martin was. If it failed, I said, well, I made the wrong decision. But that man let you know all the time, I'm going to lead with a plan, and i got to pray about it, think about it, and then act on it. And so throughout his career, so when now I've got to put into context what he said to me at the going to the airport, I'm not going. I don't feel that the country, because he felt that that Memphis thing was set up. He'd never had violence on the march. Right. So he said, this, is, this timing is not right. So knowing how he viewed the plan before the action, I knew then he thought about this, probably prayed that night over it. I don't know what he did and what all he went through, but when he tells you something, you can put your bottom dollar on it because you can bet that Dr. King is making the right decision. The only thing that we can say he tripped up on is he misjudged Chicago. Mm -hmm. But he was advised not to go to Chicago and he didn't follow the advice. Yeah, but Chicago Negro was very particular. Yeah, right. So he went there <laughs> and daily said, this is my town. You're not coming in here. And uh, people had told him, my husband told him. He said, no, that's town. He ain't going to let nothing. They're going to tear up Chicago. And so he, he realized now, and, and, and there's a, I think I've seen where he, he laughs about it. that Chicago was tough. He, it was tougher than Alabama and Mississippi and every place else. Chicago. Well, he actually was quoted as saying, and the reason I, I quoted it because when I moved to, when I moved to Chicago to run the Chicago Defender, um, even though this was 2004, he goes to Chicago in 1966. Uh, Negroes were the same way. I'm using Negroes for a reason. Mm -hmm. They were the exact same way. Because mm -hmm. uh, I got an extremely uh, mm -hmm. negative reaction coming. Mm -hmm. And again, I also was a little bit more crazier when mm -hmm. I said, well, clearly y'all know what the hell y'all was doing. That's why I'm here. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, so, but yeah, and that, cause that was a quote where he said, if we could change the Chicago Negro, mm -hmm. he said, we could change every Negro in America, yeah, right. oh, if yeah. we could change the Chicago oh, Negro. And he would laugh. Some of his best laughter was over the Negroes in Chicago. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, so he, so when, and so he didn't do, that was the only time when he really kind of messed up his movement there. But everything else, Martin Luther King thought and prayed and thought and prayed, and then he acted. A couple more things for you, becoming the first African American in the South with a primetime show. How'd that happen? I didn't ask for it. I was thrust upon it. Martin used to talk about all the time um, how he really appreciated the press. He said, when we talk about um, children trying to swim in the public pool and they throw a lie in there to prevent it, or some dogs nipping at your rear ends, um, that means that them people are serious. And he said, uh, the press dramatizes. You weren't just not stories you make up. When the press moves in on them, they dramatize it and make it a fact that you got to believe. And so he used to say, you know, I believe in the press and the press. And he used to tell all the time. And they asked him to appear for the press club to tell them how wonderful they were. So he said, you know, they really help us a lot. I said, Martin, I don't happen to agree that the press is all that great. And my good friend was Ralph McGill, who was the publisher of the Atlanta Constitution. And Mr. McGill played funny games like this. Uh, he would accept an engagement. And then he'd back out and said, oh, I'm sorry. At the last minute, I can't come, but I'll send my representative. 
and I'd be the representative. <laughs> he said he liked the way I handle race relations, that he said I, uh, I would teach a lesson without preaching a sermon, which I thought was a great compliment to me. You teach a lesson without preaching a sermon. So now this particular engagement Mr. McGill had was before religious press people. And so uh, he sent me, I was a, a substitute. And I said, well, you know, Dr. King really praises members of the press. I mean, he loves the media. I don't happen to agree with him on this issue. And I said, and the reason I don't is, I said, I can't find any sensibility in this picture. Television station gets a word that they're denying some black kids or whatever the problem is over here. Got a shutout going on. They can't move here. They can't swim there. So now the white assignment editor gives the story to a white reporter who carries his white cameraman with him, and they go to the scene of the shutout. They get the footage and bring it back to a Lily White processor, who gives it to a Lily White writer, <laughs> who gives it to a Lily White editor, who gives it now to a Lily White uh, anchor. And they come on and say, oh, isn't this awful? And I said, I don't see the difference. It's shut out over here, it's shut out over there. And that was my speech. Well. Mr. McGill called me and said, what in the world did you say today? He said, the television stations are called me and said, you embarrassed them today. And um, one station called me, and it was the CBS affiliate, and said, uh, boy, you turned it on us today. Um, <laughs> but we'd like to take you to lunch, and I'll call Mr. McGill, listen, if I'm not, if I'm not back by 1.30, put out APB on it, because they're taking me somewhere, I don't know where. But guess what, they said they had not thought of that the way I dramatized that picture, they felt guilty. And they said, now we want to do something about it and we need your help. And so I got in to help them, like find somebody. But they decided that I was the one they wanted because I had already credibility and so forth. And they just said, we want you to help change the look of our station. So they threw me on TV. I didn't ask for it, but it gave them a lot of bragging rights and then I, the white community embraced me immediately, and that made me an instant success. And so with success, you just move. And they, uh, I was just reading an article, um, ran into an article where they were gonna take me national um, after you know eight months, uh, because they said I was just a natural. I didn't use cue cards and stuff. You know, me, all you have to do is ask me how are you, and I, <laughs> I just talk. It was a talk show, so I just talk. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm going to ask you about the Trumpet Awards, which is my last question. But i got to go back. How are you having dinner with the head of the KKK? I'm listed in the books now as the one who caused him to get out. He changed his own stripes, denounced the organization, and withdrew. And he was the Grand Dragon, which is the highest order, I mean, a highest officer. But I so met, what, did he call you? Did, well, let me tell you, we met because we had, we meaning Atlanta, had one of those model cities programs, you know, years ago, where you take five diverse communities and see if you can get them all to figure out how to live together or how they live separately, or what the living patterns <laughs> ought to be. And so one of these communities was a white, kind of half poor community, but all white. and. Um, Mr. Craig lived in that community. And uh, so then they formed a, a interracial, I mean, uh, integrated, um, meaning all these five communities had representatives on a kind of a board. And then he, he, the mayor, wanted me to run the board. And he said, but I gotta tell you something, there's a Ku Klux who's a member of that board. And I said, well, I don't know what they look like anyway, so I won't. <laughs> <laughs> they don't have white sheets on, I don't know what a, Klansman looks like. Well, I was already on television, so people knew me. And so they'd come up and shake out, oh, Miss Clayton, glad to meet you, glad to have you part of this operation. And I said, and this one man came and gave me some fingertips instead of a handshake. Oh, that is he, I'm sure. You know? <laughs> 
But every day he came to my office and we talk about crazy stuff. Well, without acting crazy with him, I just said, oh, Mr. Uh, hmm, Craig. Craig, how do you get such warped thinking? Then I found out he was a deacon in his church and I found out he was chairman of the deacon board. And I said, how? The Grand Jacket, Grand Jacket of the KKK. Yeah. yeah. And a Baptist church, I said, well, listen, I'm a Baptist. What, what book do you all read? It doesn't, mine doesn't say feed the hungry and clothe the naked only if they look like you. It doesn't say that in my book. What does your book say? Well, I kept on every day we would talk. I didn't know he was going home telling his family, you know, that Miss Clayton's a nice person. But people tell me he said he did, but he, I don't have time to tell you. But I just knock it down on oh, Mr. Gray. But I said, let me ask you this. Now, in my church, the pastor is the head man, but that deacon is second to the pastor, and you chairman of the board, how can you stand before that congregation with bigotry in your heart, knowing you're filled with it, and now you've got to stand before them representing God? How could you do that? And I said, you got children. Every Friday, he would tell me what he's doing on the weekend, get up the kids, put the robes on, they go out to do harm to people. How could you do that as a Christian? Well, that's the way I would talk to him all the time. I was the most surprised person in the world when one Saturday, I, came, I went out shopping, came home, on my street, I had all these cars, police, the um, television stations, had cars in front of what in the world? I, you know, since I live in the hood, I thought I'd been burglarized. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and what happened is Mr. Craig had a press conference. He announced he was getting out, denouncing the organization, and he was getting out. And credited a black woman with changing his negative attitudes, and I was that black woman. And then that was the story. Just went all wow. over them. And we got tons and tons of mail. We were invited to London, to everywhere, to appear on television to talk about this experience, you know. But he says uh, that I helped to change all of his thinking. Vernon Jarrett said he was, last question, Vernon Jarrett said when he, he saw some young men in the basketball court in Chicago, there was no basketball goal, lights were off, but they literally were running plays as if they were playing basketball. He said, if black, black kids can have that kind of imagination, he said, we got to be able to take advantage of that. That led, that led him to create NAACP AXO competition. What led you to say, we got to have the Trumpet Awards? I was tired of seeing us on television uh, acting like buffoons all the time, never people would stand up and speak English. And I kept hearing in my ear and in my head ringing that Dr. King said he didn't think that all white people hated us, that if they knew us, you know, things would be different. And I said, you know what, they really don't know us. They don't know Charles Drew a man who died because he couldn't get some of the blood he was saving for other folk. And so I said, here I am was working at that time with the CNN operation. I had television at my disposal and a man who was sympathetic to the issues of the day. And I said, I think uh, I can do something to help change these negative attitudes. So I went to Ted and after I drew up my plan, uh, went to him and asked him, could I do it? And he liked the idea and it became a reality. And um, I did reap uh, some of the predictions that Martin had talked about, that we got letters from white America um, who said now, you know, we've changed their attitudes and now they see what we were talking about and yes, we have contributed. So that's what got me to do it. 20, 30, 40 years from now, it's gonna be a child in Atlanta, child in Chicago, LA, somewhere. They'll be doing a paper, they'll be doing some research, they might come across a YouTube video, they might come across a quote from Zenona Clayton. What do you want that child, not even born yet, to know about you? Well, I first, wherever I am, I hope I'm upstairs there somewhere. I hope- Ordering folks around. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, I have to be in charge. You know. 
Um, first, I'd hope that they would, my name would be somewhere, because I'm not sure it will. People, when you die, will just say you die and they forget you. But I'd like to think, and I would hope they would say, that I acted like a Christian and I was a good patriot. I believe that we're going to have a great America because I basic, I believe that people basically are good. My hopes are strong that we are going to have this great America. And I hope that I help change some negative attitudes somewhere along the way. I got one I can claim. You know, Calvin Craig puts me in good shape. And I do feed the hungry and clothe the naked because that's part of the Christian duty. So I hope that somebody will see in those actions that maybe I was a pretty good person to have lived around if they could have lived with me, that I'm a good person and I was worth knowing. Well, of course you're worth knowing. And it's great to know you. And I belong here. <laughs> there you go. Mm -hmm. It's always good to see you. My pleasure. I appreciate it. Love you. Love you as well. Mm -hmm. You want to check out Roland Martin Unfiltered? YouTube.com forward slash Roland S. Martin. And subscribe to our YouTube channel. There's only one daily digital show out here that keeps it black and keep it real. It's Roland Martin Unfiltered. See that name right there? Roland Martin Unfiltered. Like, share, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. That's YouTube.com forward slash Roland S. Martin. And don't forget to turn on your notifications so when we go live, you'll know it.